So we're very glad to have Tritel Parsi uh, here as our uh, keynote speaker. Uh, he's an independent scholar and founder and current president of the National Iranian American Council. He, uh, he has served as an adjunct faculty scholar, uh, policy fellow at various institutions, uh, in particular Johns Hopkins University, Johns Hopkins University's uh, School of Advanced International Studies, uh, the Middle East Institute, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Uh, he's a is an elo eloquent speaker. He's been writing uh, quite a few books, award-winning ones. And uh, what, a couple of examples of those books, one that just came uh, out this year is called Losing an Enemy, Obama, Iran, and the Triumph of Diplomacy, Yale University Press. Uh, earlier, he had another um, book on uh, the same range of issues, A Single Roll of the Dice. Obama's Diplomacy with Iran, uh, which is Yale University Press. Uh, he has appeared in media regularly, and in fact, recently he was interviewed by the Real News Network for about an hour and a half in three parts. And uh, he's very well known for his activities uh, regarding building better understanding of the situation uh, in the Middle East, especially concerning Iran. I would like to invite uh, Twitter to come to the podium. Do you, do you rather sit there or do you need the computer? No, I'll, I'll use this. Thank you so much. It's a great, great pleasure being here. Um, nothing will wake you up as much as talking about geopolitics in the Middle East and a potential military confrontation with Iran, which unfortunately, in my view, uh, is starting to come back onto the table. As you all know, on October 15th, Donald Trump will make a final decision as to whether he will decertify the Iran nuclear deal, and that will trigger a process in which Congress will begin considering reimposing sanctions on Iran, which would be a clear violation of the nuclear deal, which would then potentially could cause the deal to collapse, which then would bring us back to the situation that existed prior to the nuclear deal, which is one in which, on the one hand, the Iranians continued their nuclear program, and on the other hand, the United States was inching closer towards a military confrontation. But I'd like to take a step back and remind and give you uh, a background to this because ultimately as much as this is about the nuclear issue it is taking place in a geopolitical context that to a larger extent is actually influencing the course of events. Uh, so I would like to give you a presentation on the geopolitics behind this as well as some details of how the negotiations came about and what happened in them because I think they're quite interesting and give us us also some clues. And that is largely based on the fact that I was put in a rather unique position in the last couple of years. I advised the Obama administration on the nuclear talks. I also had very good access to uh, the Iranians. Um, it wasn't unusual that I could be at the White House early in the week uh, for a briefing and then later in the week be at the nuclear talks and then having a two-hour private conversation with the Iranian foreign minister. And this give me, gave me a, a unique front seat privilege to be able to see what was happening, the calculations on both sides, their fears, uh, their hopes, their strategies. And I thought that would be an interesting story to tell, um, one in which we showed you know, how diplomacy actually succeeded in preventing uh, a military confrontation that truly was uh, on the verge of happening. And this all happened, incidentally, without a single shot being fired, without a single angry 4 a.m. tweet being fired off. Uh, and that would be uh, a valuable lesson, I think, for the United States, particularly when it comes to what is happening in North Korea right now. So let me take you back in history a little bit to go over why this actually, in many ways, is not really about the nuclear issue. April 2012. As the United States was amassing sanctions on Iran, 
The Iranians were aggressively advancing their program, and the Israelis were making regular threats of potentially taking military action against the Iranians. A most unusual group of officials and former officials gathered in a very small European country far away from the eyes of the media. There were several Iranian ambassadors there in the room, including members of the Iranian nuclear negotiation team. Several US officials, including a very, very senior American general. But perhaps most surprisingly, there was a very interesting Israeli delegation at the meeting as well. Very senior. And this is at a time, of course, when the, United States, the Iranians and the Israelis officially don't recognize each other or talk to each other. So having all of them in the room at the same time was truly a unique moment. But the surprises didn't end there. The most shocking part was actually what was said. Let me give you a quote. This is not about enrichment. This was never about enrichment. The room was as silent as this one is as the Israeli official looked across the room straight into the eyes of the Iranians and uttered these words. Now, for more than two decades, we had heard that Iran's nuclear program, particularly its enrichment of uranium, constituted an existential threat to Israel. We heard that without Iran completely ending its nuclear program or its enrichment of uranium, there could not be a solution that Israel or the United States could accept. But now we had a very, very senior Israeli official saying that all of those threats of war actually were not driven by the nuclear program. Instead, he explained, Israel needed to see a sweeping attitude change on behalf of Iran. The Israelis could not accept that the United States would come to terms with Iran without the Iranians coming to terms with Israel at the same time. And Israel was not going to allow the United States to strike a deal with Iran that would see Iran's isolation in the region come to an end without the Iranians making the significant change uh, in their posture towards uh, Israel. Otherwise, Israel would end up feeling abandoned in the region, facing what would be a continuous hostility from Iran without having the full uh, uh, commitment and backing of the United States. So Israel could not accept this, and it would do everything in its power to stand in the way of any agreement for that very reason. This was made quite clear. This was not just a moment of honesty, it was a moment of utmost clarity that showed what some of the true driving forces of this conflict was. To understand the message of the Israeli official, we need to better understand the geopolitical context of all of this. We need to go back another two decades. 1991, the Soviet Union has collapsed, Iraq has been defeated by the United States in the second Persian Gulf War. This was a geopolitical earthquake on a global and on a regional scale. On a global scale, of course, the United States now emerged as the sole superpower of the world. Regionally, the old order had collapsed, but it was not yet clear what new order would be ushered in. With Iraq defeated, Iran and Israel emerged as two of the most powerful states in the region. Uh, for decades prior to this, because of a sense of common threats, the Israelis and the Iranians had quietly in the background, quite secretly, had a rather extensive security collaboration, which essentially was driven by the fact that they shared common threats. And those two common threats was the Soviet Union and it was Iraq as the most powerful military Arab power in the region. But with these threats gone, and with the region that yearned for a new order, Israel and Iran increasingly started viewing each other as rivals. It wasn't because of Iran's ideology, although of course that played a role in it, because back in the 1980s, when Iran's ideology was far more uh, fervent than it is during the 90s, uh, the Israelis were still dealing with Iran in the background, and perhaps more importantly, they were the ones lobbying for Iran in Washington telling the Reagan administration to talk to Iran, to sell arms to Iran, and not pay attention to Iran's very, very hostile anti-Israeli and anti-Western rhetoric. But with this new change in the region, there was a need for a change on the side of these two states as well. Israel cleverly moved and managed to convince the United States 
that Iran was now the greatest threat to the region. And for Israel to be able to take that risk for peacemaking with the Palestinians, it needed the United States to contain and isolate Iran. The Clinton administration accepted that proposition and adopted a policy that was called the dual containment policy. A new order was established in the region centered on Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt based on the exclusion and containment of Iraq and Iran at the same time. For Iran, this was a huge blow. They had hoped that after uh, some limited collaboration with the United States during the Persian Gulf War, that this would be their ticket out of the isolation that they had more or less brought onto themselves with the radical foreign policy that they pursued in the 1980s. Instead, the United States doubled down and intensified an effort to isolate and contain Iran. Tehran's response in turn was to spread extremism and targeting what they view to be the weakest link in the American-Israeli strategy, which was the peace process. As long as the peace process was unsuccessful, they believed, they calculated, that none of the other geostrategic objectives of the United States and Israel could be achieved in the region. If the American order was built on Iran's isolation, Iran was going to make it as difficult and as costly for the United States to pursue that policy. That was their calculation. But despite their efforts, and indeed they had significant efforts, it wasn't Iran that brought the collapse of the American order. It was the United States itself. By the Bush administration going into Iraq in 2003 with the objective of defeating the uh, regimes in the region that were hostile to the United States, replacing them with more friendly and pliant regimes in order to be able to enhance and strengthen American hegemony in the region. The United States succeeded in taking out Iraq, of course, but it did not succeed in building a new order. Rather, it only succeeded in destroying the old order. And in the process, it weakens itself to the point in which it no longer had the capacity to be able to impose on the region a new equilibrium. And what we've had ever since, essentially, is an orderless Middle East without a clear hegemon, without a clear uh, picking order. And so much of the violence and warfare we're seeing today is precisely because of a combination of the voids that have been created that are sought to be filled by various stronger uh, parties, as well as this fear that exists in every strong uh, country in the region, that if they don't act, if they don't try to fill these vacuums, their competitors are going to get an edge and they're going to be in a position to define the order in the region for the foreseeable future. So this has then further intensified this rivalry and this drive to be able to define what the new order in the region should be. For Israel and Saudi Arabia, and this is important because now we're getting closer to why there was such a strong opposition to the nuclear deal. For Israel and Saudi Arabia, the collapse of Pax Americana was a disaster. They were the main benefactors of the old order. They enjoyed significant maneuverability in the region, completely under the protection of the United States. For Iran, it was actually a blessing in disguise. The United States, of course, had eliminated two of Iran's immediate threats, the Taliban in Afghanistan, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. Now, of course, um, it had also in the process weakened itself to the extent that it was increasingly difficult to contain Iran. But as long as the United States continued to refuse negotiations with the Iranians, the Iranians had great difficulty locking in this new favorable geopolitical reality. It needed a crisis that, for, that would force the United States to recognize that Iran is a major power in the region and that the reality of the region requires the United States to seek a more normal approach towards Iran, not necessarily a more normal uh, relationship. That recognition from the United States was critical for the Iranians, but it was also precisely um, that reason that the Israelis did not want to see Iran gain this. Ironically, the Iranians and the Israelis chose the same instrument to achieve their opposite objectives, for the Iranians to be able to get America's recognition, for the Israelis to prevent that from happening. And that was the nuclear program. For the Israelis, 
This menacing program was used to make unrealistic demands that would ensure that no compromise could be found on this issue. And that is, of course, the demand that Iran completely seize all enrichment activities. Without a compromise, a threat that had been defined as an existential threat eventually would lead to the United States being forced to take military action against Iran. And the balance of power that would emerge after an American military operation against Iran, the Israelis calculated, would be, of course, beneficial to the Israelis. For the Iranians, they had a different calculation. True, by pushing forward with their nuclear program, they did risk increasing things, the temperature towards a war. But precisely because war had become so costly for the United States in Iraq and because the Iranians had developed a certain deterrence capacity against the United States because of the vulnerability of the United States in Iraq and in Afghanistan, increasing the temperature also had the potential opportunity of forcing the United States to come to terms with the fact that a complete containment and confrontation with Iran was no longer possible or feasible. Forcing the United States to adopt a more, in their view, realistic approach to Iran that would lead to the United States and Iran negotiating, which then would uh, lock in or would give the Iranians the, the recognition that they needed in order to be able to lock in the more favorable balance. The crux for the United States in all of this was how to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapons option without going to war, without allowing the Israelis to start a war, and without allowing the Iranians to end up in a position in which after a potential negotiation, they would be in a position to define the new balance of power in the region. Now, the Bush administration's strategy, of course, was to refuse negotiations. They, they, worldview was that the United States is the ultimate source of legitimacy in the international system and whoever the United States talks to has the benefit of having some of that awesome American legitimacy rub off on them. So not negotiating was a way of depriving the Iranians of that diplomacy. It was also a policy that was utterly unsuccessful. In 2003, Iran had roughly 150 centrifuges. It had no stockpile of low enriched uranium. By 2008, when Bush left office, the Iranians had 8,000 centrifuges and roughly 1,500 kilos of low enriched uranium, which uh, could be enough to be able to build one nuclear bomb. Clearly, a new approach was needed. And when Senator Obama began his campaign, he made the idea of reinstating diplomacy at the center of American statecraft uh, a critical part of his foreign policy platform. Negotiating with Iran, of course, ended up becoming the one that took the most uh, attention be precisely because of the controversy around Iran. It was far more controversial than talking to Chavez or even talking to, to Castro. But it was all part and parcel of a different approach to his foreign policy. And in 2009, when he became president, there was an attempt to pursue diplomacy, but diplomacy ended up being much, much more difficult than Obama had expected. Uh, a good effort was made in 2009. It failed primarily because of problems on the Iranian side. And domestic political realities hit the president pretty quickly. And pretty soon, within a year, he was pretty much where Bush had been before, in the sense that the instruments he had to deal with Iran ended up being pretty similar to what the instruments the Bush administration had. Sanctions, cyber warfare, uh, and other forms of coercion coercion and, and pressure. But precisely because Obama had tried diplomacy, which Bush had not, precisely because Obama did have international legitimacy, which again, Bush did not, Obama succeeded where Bush could not, which is that he managed to get uh, a significant, in some ways an unprecedented, sanctions regime against the Iranians. Uh, the United States even sanctioned Iran's central bank, effectively cutting Iran off of the international financial system. The economy contracted in Iran. Uh, you had the week when the central bank sanctions were passed, the Iranian currency dropping 30% in just two or three days. Uh, the Europeans were convinced to do something that prior to this was considered completely impossible, which was to 
cut off all of their oil imports from Iran. Iran roughly exported 40% of its oil to the Europeans. This was a huge blow to the Iranian economy. And for a moment, it looked as if Iranian capitulation, which essentially meant them giving up their enrichment, uh, was in the cards. When riots broke out in Tehran uh, over the currency issue, people in the White House was following it very closely, hoping that what was happening in Iran would be a repeat of what, what, what had happened in Tunisia just months earlier. Of course, that did not end up happening, though. But the Iranians had truly underestimated Obama. They never thought he would be able to assemble such a strong sanctions regime against Iran. But Obama had also underestimated the Iranians. Without a doubt, the Iranians hurt, but they didn't break, nor were they without a response. Just as, he had es just as Tehran had escalated their nuclear program in response to Bush's refusal to negotiate, now the Iranians doubled down on their enrichment program and their nuclear program as a counter pressure to the sanctions. If the sanctions, from the American perspective, were aimed at changing Iran's cost-benefit analysis and make the Iranians realize that you essentially had to choose between having an enrichment program and having an economy, the Iranian doubling down on the sanctions had the exact same calculation. Increase the cost for the sanctions policy to prove to Washington that sanctions cannot work. Let me give you a quote from uh, Hassan Rouhani's chief of staff that I interviewed. Our strategy was to break the mentality of the other side by showing them that pressure wouldn't work. So we escalated our nuclear activities to show what pressure would produce. The end result was that the U.S. inched closer towards crippling Iran's economy, while Iran inched closer towards having a nuclear fait accompli, and the Israelis inched closer towards starting a war. The question was, which one of these clocks, the nuclear clock, the sanctions clock, or the Israeli clock, ticked the fastest? As they were ticking, the president realized and was convinced that he needed to have a secret channel to the Iranians, because in the official P5 plus 1 negotiations that was taking place at the time, nothing really was being achieved. It was just a set of competing speeches by the two sides. Let me give you a colorful example. The Iranians insisted during the Jalili years that uh, when the P5 plus 1 met with Iran, all of the other delegations had to come into the room and sit down. And once everyone was seated, the Iranians would enter the room and take their seats. Once the session was over, uh, the Iranians would have to stand up first, completely leave the room before any other delegation was allowed to stand up. And this was aimed to make sure that there was absolutely no side chit-chats or any other type of communication between the two sides except for the actual official negotiations. As you can imagine, this is almost designed to make sure that negotiations couldn't work. So President Obama realized he needed a channel. And he needed a channel that was authorized by Iran's supreme leader, calculating that the Iranians will never truly compromise unless he is signing off to it. Fortunately for him, there was a senator at the time who was the head of the Foreign Relations Committee that was very committed to diplomacy and who had played an instrumental role in securing the release of three American hikers who had wrongfully been imprisoned in Iran. That's John Kerry. John Kerry had, thanks to the Omanis at the time, established a secret channel that ensured that the, uh, the Americans were released. And this proved Oman's capacity to be able to maneuver the Iranian uh, political landscape and get them to deliver. Not a lot of countries that have had that capacity or that, that track record. So through John Kerry and the Omanis, a new meeting was set up, July 2012, a couple of months before the US elections. The US side sends two mid-level officials, their names at the time hardly ever been in the press. The Iranians send three people, including their deputy foreign minister. Once he sees that the Americans don't have someone of his rank, he never enters the room, but he actually stays in a different room and negotiates from that room. The American side entered these talks because they wanted to see essentially two things. They wanted to make sure that this was an authoritative channel and that they were not just wasting time on talking to people who couldn't deliver. And they wanted to see how close are the Iranians to capitulating on the enrichment issue. How powerful and painful have the sanctions essentially been. 
The Iranians showed up not to capitulate, but to see how close is the United States towards capitulating on the enrichment issue. As you can imagine, it was a rather unsuccessful meeting. They spent a day in which most of the time the Iranians were presenting various formulations of how the U.S. could accept enrichment, which the U.S. had to reject all of them because the diplomats had no authority to be able to even address that issue in substance. They were only there for procedural reasons. It's a failure. And then you have the elections in the United States in November, uh, and no major uh, activity is taking place. But by January 2013, a new sense of urgency dawns on the White House. Exactly a year earlier, January 2012, then Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta had stated publicly that Iran's breakout capacity was 12 months. And I know there are people in this room that can define that much better than I can. But essentially, the time it would take for the Iranians to make a political decision, to seek a bomb, and to have the material to be able to build one. 12 months. By January 2013, it was the estimate of the US intelligence services, and this was also made public, that Iran's breakout capacity had shrunk to 8 to 12 weeks. Clearly, the Iranian nuclear clock was actually ticking faster than the sanctions clock. If nothing changed, the president came to the realization that it was far more likely that the United States would be forced to choose between war with Iran or succumbing to an Iranian nuclear fait accompli rather than seeing that Iran's collapsing economy would force them to capitulate. So the parties went back to Oman for a second meeting. This time around, the United States sends a very senior delegation and a much larger one, including then number two at the US State Department, Bill Burns. The Iranians do the same. And it's a very different meeting, mostly because of the fact that for the very, very first time ever, the US diplomats were armed with an instrument they were not even allowed to hint at before, which was a carefully worded, uh, compromise or carefully worded sentence on how the United States could accept enrichment in Iran, given Iran accepting inspections, etc. This was exactly what the Iranians had been looking for for more than 10, 15 years. And this happened incidentally while Ahmadinejad was still president. We're not talking about the Rouhani years here. But despite the fact that on the key issue of substance, the U.S. gave its biggest concession, its biggest negotiating card here. It still wasn't enough because ultimately the mistrust that exists between the United States and Iran was so significant that the Iranians could not go back to Tehran and say, well, the Americans promised us orally that they would accept enrichment. They needed this in writing. And the U.S. side had absolutely no authority to put this in writing because the fear was that A, it could leak, and mindful of the fact that this was the most valuable concession the West could give the Iranians. It was something that was supposed to be given by the West, by the US and the Europeans in tandem, not by the United States unilaterally. And moreover, the Iranians could just pocket the, the, this concession. So this could not be put in writing. So they were stuck. And this is where the Omani stepped in once more and saved the two sides. If the United States cannot write a letter to the Iranians about this, then perhaps the United States could write a letter to the Sultan of Oman, one of the very few people in this world who both the President of the United States and the Supreme Leader of Iran holds in high esteem and actually trust. Not a lot of other people in this world that can brag about that. The Sultan could then go to Iran in between his chemotherapy, meet Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, face to face, convey to him what was in the letter without bringing the letter, but tell him, this is what the Americans have promised me. They are willing to accept enrichment under these circumstances. If the Iranians then reject it, it would not be because of their distrust of the United States, but it would be because of their distrust of the Sultan, which could not happen. And this is exactly how it went down, how this very, very significant gap in trust between the United States and Iran was bridged by a third country who most people actually haven't even heard about. And I think it's important to mention, not just because of the various tricks you have to use in diplomacy, but also because in this era in which we saw the map earlier on, uh, we hear a lot about 
uh, Sunni Shia tensions, we hear a lot about Arab Persian tensions. It was an Arab country that brought the United States and Iran closer together on this issue. Now, throughout these negotiations, and of course after this, the world gets very lucky because Rouhani gets elected and they have a completely different team, much, much more capable of negotiating. They switch the language to English um, and things move relatively fast, yet it takes another 20 months before there's a final deal that is struck in July 2015. I won't go into the details of that. But I do want to say a couple of things. Throughout these negotiations, of course, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu positioned himself to be the absolute number one enemy of this deal. I mean, he did everything he could, from putting impossible demands on what the negotiations had to achieve, to going to Congress in an unprecedented move, uh, and talking against the President of the United States. But of all the different things he did, he committed a very large number of mistakes. The two foremost mistakes, I would say, are these. By, in, in some ways, actually, the deal came about thanks to him, not in spite of him. By turning this issue into an existential issue, his calculation was to force the United States to take action. Turning this into an existential issue with no compromise essentially eliminated the status quo, contain Iran, kick the can down the road option for the president. He no longer could do this because if he did, the Israeli clock would tick and they would take military action. The U.S. would be sucked into that military confrontation, which was something that the U.S. strongly opposed and did not believe there was a real military option. But his miscalculation was that by eliminating that option, he thought automatically the United States would be forced to take military action. Did not recognize that it also could lead to the United States taking diplomatic action. Because Netanyahu completely misread the American public and their war awareness that had happened. Had it not been for Netanyahu doing this, I'm personally not convinced that President Obama would have given the very significant political uh, investment into reaching this nuclear deal. It almost had to be so that he didn't have any option to do so. And that non-option essentially was presented to him by Netanyahu. Moreover, um, of all the things he did to kill the deal, there was one very, very simple thing he could have done that would have killed the negotiations, but he seemed to not have thought of it. Instead of going to the cameras and saying that this deal will pave Iran's way to a bomb, this deal is the deal of the century for the Iranians, all he needed to do was go to the very same cameras and say, this is an amazing deal. We in Israel love this deal. This is Iran's capitulation. Zarif himself told me that if Netanyahu had hugged the deal, it would have created so much political difficulties for the Iranian negotiating team that they would probably have been forced to withdraw. They had no problems dealing with Netanyahu saying this is the deal of the century for Iran. It actually helped shut down hardliners in Iran. But going and saying that this is a fantastic deal, that this is Iran's capitulation, would have created such great difficulties uh, that he could actually have killed the deal inadvertently. But in all his wisdom, he never figured this one out. This is important though because we see now, let me also say another thing before we uh, break. Netanyahu is currently now arguing that this deal needs to be uh, nixed or fixed. And again, the arguments that are being presented is that changes need to be made to the deal in order for it to be stronger. The idea that there is a stronger deal was also a present, something that was presented in 2015. It was never defined. It was always like, let's skip these negotiations and get a better deal without ever being able to say what that deal would actually look like or what a realistic path that would be. However, I would say there was a better deal that could have been struck. But that deal did not exist in 2015. That deal existed much, much earlier. By 2015, by in 2003, for instance, the Iranians sent a proposal to the White House offering comprehensive negotiations on a whole set of issues, including opening up the Iranian nuclear program for full transparency. At the time, as I mentioned, they had roughly 150 centrifuges. The proposal made its way to the White House through the Swiss ambassador in Iran, who had been tasked by the U.S. to be the um, conveyor of, of messages between the two countries. The Bush administration never responded to the Iranians. Instead, they 
reprimanded the Swiss ambassador for having delivered the proposal in the first place. Going back to the Bush administration's refusal to engage in any negotiations. In 2005, the last Iranian negotiation offer was made to the Europeans prior to Ahmadinejad winning the elections. It was actually written by Zarif, who was one of the chief negotiators at the time. This one is public, you can find it. Um, in that proposal, they offered to cut their program at 3,000 centrifuges. At one of the meetings, th that proposal actually never made its way to the White House because the Europeans did not even bother sending it to the White House knowing that anything above zero would have been nixed anyways. At one of that White House briefings, someone mentioned that proposal because we were all trying to get an idea of where are the negotiations going to end vis-a-vis -vis previous offers. And one of the American negotiators laughed out and said, you know, oh, we would jump on that proposal if it existed today. But that train has already left the station. A couple of weeks later, I'm in Lausanne, sitting with Zarif, trying to do exactly the same thing, trying to figure out exactly where are you going to end up on this. And I asked him, do you think it would be uh, more centrifuges compared to what you offered to stop at in 2005? Uh, and I had to remind him about that proposal. And he said, oh, yeah, 3,000. Yeah, that was just an opening offer. We were going to settle for 1,000. By 2013, the Iranians had 22,000 centrifuges, 19 of them were operating, and by the time the deal was struck, the Iranians are keeping more than 5,000 centrifuges. Beyond that, their stockpile of enrichment have grown, their knowledge of the process, all of these things have grown significantly. That is not to say that sanctions don't play a role, but we have an approach in Washington in which we magically assume that nothing happens on the other side when sanctions are being imposed, that there is no alternative cost to this policy. The alternative cost to this policy is that the Iranians double down on enrichment and on nuclear capacity, and by the time the two sides finally managed to get back to the negotiating table, yes, the U.S. had leverage because of sanctions, but the Iranians also had leverage because they had expanded the program. And where they ended up, to me, it seems like the Iranians actually had managed to get more leverage than the U.S. side. And we have to keep this in mind, particularly when we're looking at North Korea and other examples right now, that when you combine an approach that is very, very centered on pressure and very little diplomacy and flexibility, uh, and you combine that with um, unrealistic demands, then in some ways you actually are truly undermining yourself. Certainly that was the case in the Iranian example. To what is happening right now, I think we can see quite clearly that the effort to try to kill this deal goes back to what this issue was about, particularly for the Israelis and the Saudis. The Saudis were quite clear, actually, in their communications with the White House. They never came to the Obama administration with any new ideas of how many centrifuges Iran should keep or how the cascades should be monitored. They had no knowledge about this and they didn't even pretend to. Their objection was, how on earth can you strike a deal with Iran, with that regime? That was the main thing, because of what that would do to the geopolitics of the region. By striking this deal, yes, Iran's path to nuclear weapon was closed, war with Iran was also averted, but more importantly, perhaps, the United States came to end a 35-year policy of seeking an all-out containment and isolation of Iran. Immediately after this deal, actually during the negotiations, the ground was being prepared for follow-on negotiations in Syria. Just months before, the United States, still holding the, the posture of containing Iran, ensured that the Iranians were not inv invited to the Geneva negotiations on Syria. As soon as the deal was struck, the U.S. changed its position 180 degrees. And now the U.S. was pushing not only for Iran to be there, but Obama himself picked up the phone and spoke to King Abdullah, insisting that Saudi Arabia was not allowed to boycott the talks just because the Iranians were there. And this is precisely what they were so fearful of, that this would legitimize Iran, that Iran would be treated as a normal country in the region that the United States had difficulties with, but it was no longer buying into an all-out containment policy, that it was no longer seeking an order in the region that was based on Iran's exclusion. And now they've gotten a second bite at the ba apple as a result of uh, President Trump coming in, who has bought into this line. And in the next two or three weeks, we will see if this is going to be the path the United States fully will pursue or not. I'll stop there. Thank you so much.
Certainly. Uh, you're quite right. Uh, they deserve a mention or two. Um, it was quite fascinating to see that throughout these negotiations, uh, the Russians, by all accounts, played a very constructive role. Uh, and in some cases, actually saved the United States at the last minute. They were one of the few countries that had the ability to really put pressure on the Iranians on some key issues, such as snapback, such as the ballistic missiles issue. Uh, and the fear that the Ukrainian crisis, which of course played out in the midst of this, would color the negotiations never really happened. On the contrary, there seems to have been some evidence that the nuclear negotiations helped contain the Ukrainian crisis slightly. Today, we're in a different situation, of course. All of the P5 plus one states, with the exception of the United States, are fully committed to the deal. They completely oppose the idea that the United States would walk out or try to renegotiate the deal. Uh, anyone who was anywhere no near these negotiations would know that there's absolutely no desire whatsoever to go through this excruciating uh, ex exercise once more. I remember one of the sessions when they were quite close to a deal, but they didn't get it. At 2 a.m. or so, an absolutely furious Lavrov came down to the lobby of the hotel. His security personnel had the entire hotel, uh, everyone more or less evacuates so that he can go to the bar and order a full, a full bottle of whiskey, uh, vodka. They're not going to go through this again. I'm not saying that he's going to stop drinking vodka, but the idea of them constantly having to pay so much attention to this issue. John Kerry, for the last session, I think he was in Vienna 21 days in a row. He's a Secretary of State of the United States. His responsibility is the entire globe. This is actually one of the things the Iranians used. Zarif could easily just focus on this issue. Iran's responsibilities are far less, but it was very difficult for the United States to devote so much time to this issue for long stretches of time. So there's no desire whatsoever. But the geopolitics have changed, because right now in the Middle East, Russia is the only country that has good relations with all major players in the Middle East and is improving its relations further with all of those states. Certainly rather the opposite scenario that you have with the United States. So, Russia's role in all of this is going to grow significantly. And in the specific context of this deal, there is some belief, potentially, that even if the United States walks out of the deal, the rest of the countries could hold it up, granted that the U.S. doesn't reimpose sanctions. But if the U.S. itself walks out but doesn't take punitive measures against Russian, Chinese, and European companies, perhaps the deal could still survive. So, as you know, there are, uh, one could say, two broad threads among political uh, actors supporting the deal in the United States. One story is, uh, this is a great deal, a great, great thing to happen, we support it, and if that's all we could ever have, that's what's worth doing, but we hope for more. We hope that would be the first step towards other things, pushing towards normalization, having to be able to talk about problems, you know, address breach on issues. And then the other camp is, this is it. This is all the diplomacy with Iran we get. And a lot of that camp is, and in time, um, uh, what we need to do in order to preserve the deal is escalate all the proxy wars. Uh, we need to reassure Israel and Saudi Arabia Green light gold for every other deal, Syria, Yemen, and so on. I'm very concerned in this moment that this second view, as, as it was in the past, is kind of hegemonic. Okay? Uh, in order, you know, like uh, Jake Sullivan had this up in the New York Times the right way to get tough with Iran. Save the deal, reassure our Sunni allies by escalating the military. And the, what wasn't stated in the outfit, like what that looks like on the ground, like escalating in Yemen means millions of human beings who starve to death because that's what, you know, just like in the Cold War we had like wars and communism, and then you look at the details, lots of civilians are getting killed. So that's what's happening in Yemen. Uh, you know, the story is destabilizing Iranian activities, but the reality is helping Saudi Arabia 
So how can we, in this moment, uh, be you know the group of people that we support the Iran deal and but we also oppose the regional escalation of the proxy war in Iran and in particular Iran? Yeah. Thank you. I think your analysis is quite correct, and I think what you put your finger on is uh, a division that also existed within the Democrats. You know, the Obama camp would have preferred to pursue this path further to see what other problems could have been resolved. The Clinton camp, which was skeptical of this approach to begin with, they played ball, but they were not the ones who were willing to take the big risks, um, have shifted back to, okay, we got the deal now, but now we have to compensate for the deal by going really aggressive in the region in order not to lose the Saudis and the Israelis. So instead of seeing a deal that has worked, that has, has been quite positive as something to build upon, we have to kind of apologize for it by going more aggressive and hawkish in other areas. That is right now the most likely path uh, because that is the dovish fringe of the Trump administration. Those, I, I use the word dovish in a, in a rather inaccurate way here, I guess, but nevertheless. Um, the idea, keep the deal, but go really aggressive. And I think what it does, it, it misses one of the main benefits, side effects of this deal, which is that after this deal, we had the first opportunity in three decades to have an all-inclusive security dialogue in the Middle East. I mean, when the, even though those Syria talks in Geneva did not yield anything, there were only a few meetings nevertheless, it was the first time the Saudis, the Iranians, and the Americans, and everyone else were actually sitting at the table at the foreign minister level. At the end of the day, in order to get out of the orderlessness that exists in the region, we will either have warfare until a new balance emerges, or we will have diplomacy. And that diplomacy has to be an all-inclusive one in order for it to work. That path is being closed down both by Trump uh, going to Riyadh and arguing in favor of um, calling on Iran's isolation once more, uh, as well as uh, the effort of thinking that now we have to go all aggressive. And I want to just emphasize, I think there's obviously policies of Iran in the region that need to be addressed, but we have one example in 37 years in which the United States actually has managed to change Iran's policy. One example, and that's this deal. None of the other efforts actually have worked. They may have temporarily shifted Iran's posture, but they have not worked in a sustained way. Yet we're not grasping on that to say, okay, what can we use? How can we use this to build on it and address these other issues, whether it's ballistic missiles, Hezbollah? Instead, we're going back to the policies that have a 37-year track record of utter failure. Uh, there seems to be a kind of a shifting uh, conversation that last year So, uh, one parenthesis first, because you, you quoted them saying behavior. Um, this is part of the language problem in Washington. I, we don't usually hear the United States talk about the behavior of other countries. We talk about their policies. On Iran, it's always behavior, as if it's an animal and we're all zoologists and biologists that are studying it. It's policies, but we say behavior. And I think it's reflective of um, rather unhelpful mindset when it comes to dealing with Iran. Um, you're quite right. There is no thing in the deal that requires the United States or Iran to change its regional policies. There's a uh, preamble to the deal that says 
that this deal, uh, if it's fully implemented, will contribute to stability in the region. And some in the, Bush, in the Trump administration have tried to use that to say that Iran is in violation of that because, but the language says full implementation and contribute. It doesn't say that it will lead to stability. Nevertheless, you can make the argument that it already has contributed since um, if there wasn't this deal, we would have more instability in the region right now because we would have a major nuclear crisis. But I think that the, the more important question is this. Yes, in Washington, a lot of people are looking at this. It's only been a year and a half of implementation, and they're frustrated that Iran has not turned into Switzerland. At the same time, you can be in Tehran, and you can ask yourself the very same question. A year and a half after this deal, how has this changed America's policies in the region? Are we selling less arms to the Saudis? Are we giving less protection to allies who we are very open about that we don't care about the human rights abuses any longer? In what ways has the United States policies changed? And I think that's where the key to this is. The only time we actually have seen a change in Iranian policy is through a negotiation in which the outcome was coupled with a change in American or Western policies. We've not seen one in which the Iranians change, but we don't change. If we want to see a change, the change has to come both ways. And this will hold very much true if we want to see a change in Iran's ballistic missiles, for instance. Rest assured, selling the Saudis $110 billion of weapons will not cause the Iranians to give up their missile program. On the contrary, they will double down on it, and they have already increased the budget for it. So if we truly want to see these changes, there is a clear path to do this, and it requires a change on our end. But a change on our end is politically very, very difficult. It is painful. We don't understand why we have to change. Can just the other side change and be as nice as we want them to be without us ever having to address any of our own policies? So you described very nicely the dynamics and the power struggle in the Middle East and the politics of this between Iran and the United States predominantly. And one side I think that you ignored a little bit is uh, this big problem of humanity as in the long term with nuclear proliferation. Yeah, um, on your latter point, the Iranians completely destroyed that reactor. They poured cement into the Iraq reactor and their plutonium path is essentially completely closed. You're, you're quite right. Um, from the U.S.'s perspective, this was very much a non-proliferation issue, as it was for many of the others as well. But uh, for some of those who drove this up onto the top of the agenda, uh, and who then later on complained about it. The, the nuclear side of it, at least for the political establishment, was secondary. For the security establishment in Israel, for instance, clearly there's strong support for this deal and they recognize the benefit this is providing Israel as well. For the political establishment, even on the political opposition to Netanyahu, you did not have strong voices being raised against Netanyahu. At most, people complain that the way he is handling it is making it more difficult for Israel because he should not be picking a fight with the President of the United States. But it wasn't on the substance of his position, it was on the manner in which he handled that issue. Thank you for your remarks. I want to talk more about the present moment in relation between the U.S. domestic politics outside the elite and then just saving the deal and moving forward. You know, uh, Iranians have uh, become much more self-aware in the last, you know, year uh, with bans on travel from their relatives or friends. Um, and I'm certainly, uh, among Iranians I know, have become much more politically engaged and seeing their you know, daily struggles linked up with a lot of other people's struggles that maybe previously they hadn't been seen. Have you noticed, so in Washington, have you noticed this, let's just say, you know, awakening or politicization of Iranians in the United States, specifically in the second 
generation Iranian, the younger Iranians, uh, and this kind of domestic political uh, struggle and movement uh, linking up with the broader agendas for U.S.-Iranian relations that you bring up. Thank you, Kirvan. Uh, I, I think you're quite correct. One thing that I think people have started to recognize, not to the extent that I would like to see, is that many of the domestic political challenges that the Iranian-American community faces, such as always being included on whatever variation of a travel ban or visa restrictions that are being made, regardless of context, etc., Iran is always in it, uh, is because at the end of the day, this has a foreign policy route. And that foreign policy route is that Iran is on the state-sponsored terror list, and it's very easy for any staffer in Capitol Hill to always make that last-minute amendment to make sure that that is included. That's what happened with the visa waiver issue, for instance. The original list didn't actually have Iran included. Um, that is important for them to recognize because ultimately it means as long as the relationship between the United States and Iran is as contentious as it is today, the idea that the Iranian-American community can completely isolate and insulate itself from those tensions is a fantasy. In the past, it was perhaps a little bit more distance to them because of a threat of war or other tensions. Right now, it is very, very much close and present to them because we're talking about the travel bans. We're talking about their ability to be able to, um, uh, even if you are a full American citizen, you were even born here, if you happen to want to marry uh, a person in Iran, you better do so before October 18th because once this new travel ban comes in, that's actually gonna be forbidden. 62% of those who are affected by the, second, the third travel ban will be Iranian, American, will be Iranian visa holders. The, without a doubt, the largest group, larger than all of the other groups. This definitely has created uh, a degree of linkage between that issue as well as other discrimination and racial injustice issues that are taking place. But I would still say that the Iranian-American community has a very, very long way to go to be fully contributing and, and recognizing itself as part and parcel with uh, other struggles in this country. There's still a degree of shyness combined with a degree of thinking, if you just go your own way, you may able be able to cut a better deal for yourself. And I think that's a complete fantasy beyond it not being moral. Uh, thank you so much. For, uh, I mean, United States uh, uh, manufacturers. Um, it feels that I have, you know, just been looking into this um, kind of extensively, and the lobbying power of these military contractors, manufacturers, I mean, Washington, Congress, is really scary. And I wanted to know whether those, that sector of the um, American corporations or manufacturers have had any impact, <coughs> excuse me, especially in the new administration or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, without a doubt, the complexity of um, the lobbying forces in favor of these forms of confrontation clearly did include those elements that you mentioned as well. Um, they may not have been on the forefront of this publicly, but they were definitely there in the background. But they also have a lot of other, um, um, how should I put it, um, rather lucrative opportunities elsewhere. They don't necessarily need war with Iran to make a tremendous amount of money. Um, they're finding their way anyways, but this was an important factor. The flip side was actually an even more important factor. In the summer of 2012, uh, 2015, when the president recognized, when he was forced because the Corker bill passed, which meant that immediately after the deal, there would be a review process in Congress and this would have to go to a vote in Congress. And Congress did have a veto on this issue because ultimately on year eight of this deal, 
Congress has to actively lift sanctions on Iran, granted that everything else has worked. Up until that point, the president is only using waivers to give uh, sanctions relief. Uh, at that point, it, it was quite clear there's going to have to be a big fight in Congress. The president had hoped to be able to avoid that. And the only tool the president had, or let me put it this, the most effective tool the president had in mobilizing people in a short period of time and make sure that their mobilization was sufficient to be able to outbalance, outstrength the other forces, including the ones that you mentioned, was to make this an issue, a choice between war and peace. Now, critics of the deal were infuriated that this was done, but there was a reality behind this, because if the deal had been rejected, uh, without a doubt, we would go back to the dynamics that existed before, in which we would, as the president said, be a path to war. So the president managed to really tap into the very, very strong anti-war sentiments amongst the public. And with allies such as Move On, Just Foreign Policy, and many other groups, a significant mobilization was made uh, in order to be able to uh, not win the vote in Congress in such a way that they won a 50-50, but because of the rules were such that the president only needed to have 34 votes to be able to uh, keep his veto against what Congress would do. Uh, there was no tool, and tests had been done, everything had been, there was no tool, there was no instrument more effective than telling the American people, if we don't do this, we are choosing war over peace. And if that's something that you care about, you better get involved, call your congressman, and it worked. What I meant, of course, war with Iran is also, you know, an economic question as well as geopolitical. But I meant the proxy wars uh, in because you mentioned that this the policy potential of intensifying uh, proxy wars in order to um, weaken Iran, but that also may have some economic benefits mm -hmm. to these uh, warmongers, whether they are Democrats or Republicans. For example, you know, in Syria, the involvement in Syria or um, Yemen, you know, they all kind of um, helps the, even the economic, you know, for the entire U.S. economy uh, may have some significance for it. You know, you're, you're quite right. It's an important factor in that as well. Um, I'd like to go back to this China business. Uh, clearly, the sanctions were intended partially to make Iran suffer economically. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, the export of oil you mentioned has essentially ceased uh, to Western Europe. During that period, it's picked up now. So China, of course, is another outlet. And I was wondering how important that is, in fact, to the Iranian economy. So um, going back to what was said earlier on, the Obama administration managed to do something that no one expected. They managed to convince the Europeans to take a huge uh, economic hit. Some European countries, their oil imports rose roughly 20% in cost as a result of this because they were so dependent on Iranian oil. But knowing very well that there would be no effect in cutting off Europe if the Iranians would just go to China, uh, the Obama administration also managed, with the help of the Saudis, to convince China to significantly cut its export imports from Iran as well. I don't have the exact numbers. But essentially, the Saudis went in with the help of the Obama administration and promised the, the Chinese that whatever they would lose as a result of not importing from Iran, the Saudis would replace. So Saudi Arabia was a critical component of making sure that you could have an oil embargo in Iran without causing a collapse of the oil markets and without causing the price of oil going up too much. The Iranians, of course, try to further rise the price by heightening politi political tensions. Um, so yeah, China played that role, but even China ended up uh, cutting a significant amount of its uh, uh, imports from Iran. Two, two questions. Um, one is, given all the controversy, maybe die down a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> about the power of Israel 
how do you sort of judge or calibrate or understand what the genuine, real power of Israel lobbies in relation to all these channels with, 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 you know, with Israel itself, whether it does represent Israel, whether it, it, it's political calculated within the American system, within your party? How do you think about that? And the other question is more of a big picture question. Um, given that we just accept the assumption that this is, this area of the world is of vital interest to, to, the, to the United States, the elites, but not the people. How, you know, in your maybe perhaps weaker moments, what do you, what do you imagine people in this country should understand in regard to whether we have any, 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 any business at all in that region, uh, you know, this long drawn out understanding, always assuming that we should have any, any say over how these people run their lives. Sure. Thank you. On to the first question, let me first point out that um, the term that you use is oftentimes used to describe the more hawkish end of organizations in Washington that uh, lobby in favor of the hawkish end of the Israeli government. One of the most important organizations in ensuring the success of the nuclear deal, particularly in Congress, was J Street, which is a pro-Israeli, pro-peace organization. So. Uh, being pro-Israel in no way automatically puts you on the side of those organizations that tr try to seek this, uh, the demise of this agreement. I think one of the things that became quite clear in the summer of 2015 is that many of these organizations have essentially had a hegemonic position on Capitol Hill, largely because of the absence of the American public. When the American public uh, is not engaged in these issues, which is 99.99% .99 of the time, then of course these groups that are quite organized and very, very well developed will have a very, very strong dominance. But every once in a while, the stars align in such a way that an issue becomes so important that it actually registers on the larger um, 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 sense of the American public. We saw that not just in 2015, we also saw that in August 2013, when President Obama decided not to go in to Syria, but actually send the issue to Congress. You had a brief moment of time and people understood that if they mobilize very quickly, they actually can have an impact on this issue. The mobilization there was astounding. Most members of Congress ended up reporting that they had roughly 97 calls in, against intervention in Syria, against three in favor. And here you had a situation in which the Obama administration was lobbying in favor of going into Syria. The defense contractors were uh, lobbying in favor of going in. AIPAC publicly took a position and did lobby in favor of going in, and yet they lost because the American public mobilized. And I think it was a very clear moment in which you see that what has been presented as a very, very strong grip is strong, but it's grip because of the absence of the American public. And of course, I'm not saying that the American public writ Raj can give up on the Kardashians and Paris Hilton, but whenever they do, they actually do have a significant impact on these issues. On to the second question that you asked. I think it's, it's a critical question. It's a question that is never asked in, in, um, in Washington. It is, as you said, it is assumed that not only is the Middle East um, a strategic vital interest, but the United States has to have a strong, if not a hegemonic, position there. This did start to change during the Obama administration. In fact, the Iran deal was a critical component of an effort by the administration to shift or to pivot to Asia. And the calculation there was that ultimately, the United States, uh, let me st start off here. The Middle East has lost a lot of strategic significance. The value of hegemony in the Middle East back in the 1990s was a very different proposition to what it is today. You have everything from shale oil explosion in the United States to other things that accounts for this. But perhaps more importantly, the cost of hegemony in the Middle East has changed dramatically in the last three decades. It's one thing to be able to sustain uh, a modicum of stability in a region where you have bad but functioning states. Now you have three failed states and potentially two more. 
Keeping hegemony under those circumstances is a very, very different proposition. Combine that with the fact that as a superpower, the United States will ultimately have to focus on what the Pentagon calls peer competitors, a country that actually could emerge to challenge the United States on a global scale, not just on a regional scale. There is no country in the Middle East that has the capacity to do so. Rest assured, the Houthis are not going to replace the United States as the world's superpower. But in East Asia, you obviously do have candidates. And the Obama administration calculation was that the U.S. was overextended, overcommitted in the Middle East, and undercommitted in Asia. In order to be able to make that pivot, which they failed at doing completely at least, it was essential not to get dragged into additional wars in the Middle East. And the one issue that was the most dangerous one in terms of the difficulty of the United States avoiding going into military confrontation was Iran. Unless the nuclear issue was resolved peacefully, it could drag the United States back into the, probably the difficult, most difficult war. And that is, again, one of the very strong motivations for the administration to do this. Rightly or wrongly, the administration did not end up going into Syria, despite a lot of other pressures after that vote to still go in. The president did manage to resist that pressure. Again, rightly or wrong, I'm not debating whether it was the right decision or not. But on Iran, it was understood in the White House that if there wasn't a diplomatic solution, if the Iranians continue with the program, it would be next to impossible not to be in. So it was needed to have that deal in order for the other part of the larger American uh, global strategy. Thank you. Uh, essentially, there's three currents that one can identify. You have what Trump himself seemed to have preferred, which is just quit the deal, doesn't matter what the cost is. If the Europeans get upset, that's actually an added bonus. The second, uh, which is um, the, the interagency recommendation that was given to Trump two Saturdays ago, argued in favor of keeping the deal but going extremely aggressive against Iran in the region. And then you also have the, perhaps what you would call the middle ground, which is don't keep the deal, but instead mess with the deal in such a way so that the Iranians end up walking out of it, whether it is to ask for access to non-nuclear sites, which eventually the Iranians most likely would end up saying no to, and then you accuse them of violating the deal, and then you can go out of the deal without having to pay the heavy cost of breaking this arrangement. Within the circle around Trump, at least, we've not been able to identify any voices that would say this actually is a good deal, let's keep it, or that there's ways to build upon it. That viewpoint does not seem to come into this mix. And this administration, I have to say, is quite more effective than the Bush administration was when it comes to not talking to people that they don't agree with. They have completely locked out people who, and particularly if you have ever said anything on Twitter, <laughs> slightly critical, um, there's a self-censorship. Staffers at the NSC would pay a price if they're seen having those meetings. So it's, it's self-censored. They just cut themselves out. And it's creating a very insulated White House with very little knowledge about Iran, to be frank with you as well. I mean, those who have had some interaction with Iran have had so in Iraq, and that interaction wasn't particularly good. So, uh, the understanding of Iran is extremely limited. Thank you. Thank you so much.